Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradi, and here at the Washington Navy Yard at the National uh, Museum of the United States Navy, one of the coolest uh, museums in Washington, D.C., that a lot of folks don't get a chance uh, to visit. Uh, and it's my positive honor uh, to uh, be interviewing uh, Captain uh, retired United States Navy Captain Don Walsh, uh, Ph.D., who with Jacques uh, Picard uh, on January 23rd, 1960, went to the Challenger Deep, 35,797 feet uh, underwater. Uh, you know, at the time, one of the most extraordinary accomplishments and one of the great honors of my life is I get to interview heroes. So, sir, you were always one of my heroes, uh, and it's an honor and pleasure seeing you, especially on this great uh, 60th anniversary of your uh, record-setting dive. You were a lieutenant at the time. Time, 1954 uh, graduate of the United States Naval Academy uh, and a submariner, I should add. Um, why, why is it that so little exploration has been done of the deep ocean? Why is it you made that trip in 1960? You worked with uh, Jim Cameron for his 2012 expedition. He became the second person. And also Victor Vescovo on the five deeps, which was just last May. Um, and I was at Challenger Deep for 10 days with him. He did. Uh, four dives in eight days to the Challenger Deep, so really reset the bar on this whole uh, ex exploration. But why is it, as you've said, we know more about the far side of the moon than we know about uh, the bottom of the oceans. Why is that, and why is it so important to explore the bottom of the ocean? There's a good reason for it. Uh, if you look at a, uh, a graph, if you will, of the amount of seafloor versus depth, you find that if you can dive to 20,000 feet, you can look at 98% of the seafloor. So only 2% is the other half. I mean, say, you know, roughly half of 36,000 feet is the deepest place, but uh, roughly half of that depth would be around 20,000 feet. So if you're a designer, an engineer, you got to pay for it, you can get 98% for uh, paying for half the depth. And for that reason, that 2% that was seldom visited. That's the deep ocean trenches. But these trenches are very important because the, if most people have heard of the idea of plate tectonics, seafloors being created on the mid-ocean mountain ranges, like the mid-Atlantic Ridge in the Atlantic, and uh, our Earth is not swelling up, it's not getting bigger, so somewhere that seafloor's got to disappear. And it takes about 200 million years, it's like a big conveyor belt, these crustal plates are moving, and it's the trenches, it's the great trenches, where we call subduction, or recycling of that seafloor, it's forced back into the interior of the Earth. And so that's what creates these trenches, especially in the Pacific. I think uh, eight of the 12 major trenches in the whole world ocean are in the Pacific, the so-called ring of fire, because there's a lot of friction there when these plates push past each other, and it pushes up islands like the Aleutians or the Japanese islands, and it also creates volcanism, volca volcanoes, because of that extreme heat of friction, and that's why that area is called the ring of fire, it's so active. So um, I'm not surprised that uh, most of the man, deep man submersibles in the world today, and there are about six or seven that can go to 20,000 feet, they can access 98% of the seafloor. So it's not surprising, if you look at that number, why people haven't gone back. Uh, but it's very, if you want to extend, uh, understand how our planet works, this whole idea of plate tectonics, what's going on in the deepest ocean, you can't just study half of it where seafloor is being created. You've got to find out what the processes are in, in the deep trenches. Um, is it also important climatologically at a time when there's a lot of concern about global warming and the role of the oceans in that, and obviously the poles, but the oceans writ large, is it important from a climatological perspective to get a better understanding of the deep ocean? I think so, uh, but frankly, if you're making investments in, in concerning the ocean's effect on, on uh, the global climate, uh, you're probably operating in shallower waters. And I'm not talking about you know, 100 feet, something like that, but thousands of feet. Uh, you know, the average depth of the world ocean is 12,800 feet, something in that order, where the Titanic is, as a matter of fact. And uh, that, uh, I think, down to those depths is where you're going to be looking for the greatest um, uh, information with, that can relate to climate uh, change. Um, why is it important that people go to the bottom of the ocean, or is it? Because if you look at it, there's been an explosion in robotic and unmanned uh, capability. There's a lot of artificial uh, intelligence that's going to go into systems like Orca or the Ocean Voyager. Uh, that's by Boeing. Um, at the end of the day, is it important to have people go to the bottom of the ocean and do some of these missions, or is this actually going to be the next big unmanned revolution? Well, my view, and I've stated it many times, is that the unmanned vehicles 
especially the AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, which are drones, basically, uh, are going to do the heavy lifting in the deep ocean exploration. They're cheap, uh, relatively speaking to man systems. Uh, they're cheap. The evolution of uh, artificial intelligence today, it's nonlinear. Uh, they can be uh, taught, if you will, programmed to do most of the things that a human can do. And we have to be able to do large areas in a reasonably short time. Only 15% of the world ocean has been explored. And yet we're talking about going to Mars and colonizing the moon and all of that. But, you know, 99.9% .9 of us and people who listen to this are condemned to life on board this large manned satellite called planet Earth. We need a mission to planet Earth. And um, so uh, I'm not saying I'm against space. I'm not. I, I'm just like equal time, if you will, for the ocean you know, of, of, of our planet. Uh, the largest single geographic planet uh, feature on our planet. We're a water planet. Although our ocean, by the way, is only, uh, I think it ranks uh, number six out of the ten oceans in our solar system. It's not the largest or the deepest. But I don't think we're going to be out exploring those for a while. Uh, I bet you'd like to get to the bottom of those, though, uh, given how many, you know, you've been doing uh, at least uh, five, six or more uh, expeditions on a yearly basis since uh, you went down to the bottom of the ocean in Trieste, which was an extraordinary uh, uh, bathys calf. But you were also a submariner. And I remember you and I were at an event a long time ago with Bob Ballard. And I did a brief interview with Dr. Ballard. And one of the things that he was talking about 25 years ago uh, was how the deep oceans are going to at some point play an even more prominent role in warfare. And if you look at the history of warfare, whether it was um, uh, telegraph cable operations in World War I, I think people have a tendency of forgetting that it wasn't just in the Cold War that the bottom of the ocean was important. And now it's becoming even more contested with Russian capabilities, certainly Chinese capabilities. How do you see the deep ocean fitting into this great power competition and contested environment that we're in right now? Well, depth is advantage. I mean, that's the third dimension of working at sea. Uh, and, and so the more depth you have, the uh, better cover you have. Now, of course, the engineering problems with uh, uh, developing a, a submarine, you know, a submerging warship, are nonlinear with depth. And so there are sort of practical limits there. I mean, something like this is very simple. You know, it's a sphere, a ball, like, you know, strong structure, like an egg. And, and so this is easy. Like you're talking about penetrations with torpedo tubes and mass and periscopes and all of that. It gets very difficult. So while, uh, you know, having depth, and depth is your friend uh, in operating a submarine, there are some limits there. Uh, I, if, I mean, I'm kind of sanguine about this whole thing about other nations developing the same capabilities. I, my, my view is the more people we get down there looking around and doing science, the better it is. Uh, the Chinese have uh, come on, they have the deepest diving man submersible in the world now with a, well, uh, uh, save for uh, Victor Vescovo's uh, mm -hmm. sub last year. He went, he went to the Challenge Deep four times in eight days uh, with a full ocean depth. But uh, the Chinese uh, Jiaolong, the Sea Dragon, as uh, was the deepest diving uh, sub until mid-year last year when Victor made his dives. So they, and they did that over a period of about 10 years and they're developing two or three other really great ocean depth subs. And the Russians have, have been in and out of that a long time. And they, the Mir, which is Russian word for peace, uh, Mir 1, Mir 2 submersibles could go to 20,000 feet. They still exist, but they're not being operated. And I made dives in those to the Titanic and to the Bismarck. Um, so uh, I say, come on in, the water's fine. By the way, you ask about man versus unmanned, and, um, and that, you know, that puzzle space program, like, why man? They're still talking about why don't you put a monkey up or, or just a computer. Uh, I think uh, Jim Cameron said it very well when asked why man. He said, because you can't teach a kid to be a robot. What kid wants to grow up to be a robot, more precisely? And so we'll always be interested in having people, but the heavy lifting is going to be done by the unmanned systems. They're reliable and efficient, and uh, we've got to get busy exploring that 85% of our oceans uh, that we don't know about.
and, and brief follow-up because I know you've got to start the presentation in a moment, but do you have any concern about sort of the weaponization of the deep ocean? There's a lot of conversation about how that is going to become uh, another uh, battlefront, and we, during the Cold War, in your generation, the United States Navy was extraordinarily dominant in the deep ocean. Is there a concern for you that from a national security perspective, whether we're making the right kinds of investments to maintain that kind of a strategic edge? I think so. You know, you're getting into a domain that's so highly classified, and I'm, of course, a civilian, uh, and I can only guess what's going on, but I can't believe that we're leaving ourselves uh, uh, non-competitive in the deep ocean. We just don't talk about it, and I have no authority in that. I mean, I've, I retired in 1975 and haven't had too much to do with the military since then, and so uh, I can only guess that uh, we're probably okay. Uh, sir, thanks very much. Retired United States Navy Captain Don Walsh, uh, who with uh, PhD, who with uh, Jacques Picard uh, aboard the Trieste in January 23, 1960, made it to the Challenger Deep, th more than almost 36,000 feet underwater. Sir, it was an honor and pleasure. Uh, look forward to talking to you uh, again, uh, certainly in the future, and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Good being with you.